Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Genesis 3 opens by introducing a new player on the scene, the Nahash, translated in English as serpent. To understand who this creature is, it requires a deep analysis of what the Hebrew is claiming. To answer the question that is often raised, is the Bible teaching a literal talking snake existed? The answer is yes and no. Genesis does teach the Nahash is serpentine, but also more. Dr. Michael Heiser has specialized in Divine Council theology and the divine beings of the Bible. In this passage, he focuses in on the Hebrew words selected to represent the villain, Nahash. Ancient Hebrew didn't have vowels, but if we supply the vowels to form a noun, it refers to a snake. But the consonants can form the root of a word for deception, so the word can also be translated to mean deceiver or diviner. Third, as the root of an adjective, the word could indicate a noun, translated to mean the shining one. Other places in the Bible use what probably is a derivation of this word to refer to the shine of brass. In fact, the ISV translation prefers to translate Nahash as shining one instead of serpent. Heiser argues the word in Genesis 3 is actually referring to all three meaning it contains a triple enton, teaching the villain as a serpent, diviner, and a shining one. With regards to two of these meanings, we can see these attributes are applied to other divine beings as well. For example, divine beings are often referred to as shining, relying on what is probably the root word Nahash. In Daniel 10.6, a derivation of Nahash refers to the shining appearance of a divine being. In Ezekiel 1.7, we see that divine beings are described as shining, like polished bronze. And the fallen one of Isaiah 14 is described as a star, and is called Hale, meaning shining one. More interestingly, the serpentine description of divine beings can also be seen. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah receives a vision of God, surrounded by winged seraphim. The word literally means to burn, and often is associated with fire. However, seraph is also a word for snake, and of the few instances in scripture, it more often refers to snakes than angelic beings. In fact, the word probably derives from the Egyptian word for snake. Trigve Medinger notes, there is now an emerging consensus that the Egyptian Urias, serpent, is the original source of the seraphim motif. Things get even more strange when we study the iconography from the same time period in Judea. We can actually find ancient depictions of seraphim, and as you can see, they are typically depicted as winged serpent-like beings. Two specifically, seal 273 and seal 274a, noted by Dr. Benjamin Somers, stand out. He says, seal 273 portrays Yahweh, symbolically as a sun disk, wearing a crown, a typical representation in Israelite Judean art. Yahweh is thus portrayed as king, and surrounding him are the seraphs. Seal 274a may betray Yahweh as king, sitting on some sort of structure or throne, also attended by a seraph, this time a seraph with wings. These seals picture basically the same scene, portrayed by Isaiah in the opening verses of Isaiah 6 1-7. The text on seal 273 states that it belongs to a courtier of King Ahaz named Ashna. In light of the similarities between the seal and Isaiah 6, it is worth noting that Jerusalem in the 8th century BCE was a very small town and that both Isaiah and Ashna lived during the reign of King Ahaz and that Isaiah enjoyed very close connections to the royal court in which Ashna served. Consequently, it is inconceivable that Isaiah and Ashna did not know each other. So given the iconography and the syntax of the Hebraic words, the most likely explanation is Isaiah's vision consisted of God being praised by winged serpentine beings. From that, it is not difficult to realize that the talking snake in Genesis 3 
is more likely a divine serpentine being in the midst of rebellion, and is of the same class as the fiery seraphim praising God before his throne. Snakes in the ancient world were often associated with divinity and wisdom for many reasons. In particular, their ability to shed their skin was a symbol of immortality and rejuvenation, and they were often perceived as crafty and intelligent. Some might object to this idea because in Genesis 3, the Nahash is referred to as a beast of the field, and divine beings are obviously different from wild animals. But this verse just says the Nahash was more crafty than the beast of the field. Some modern translations add the word other to imply the Nahash was also a beast of the field. But this is not inherent in the verse itself. Also, we need to remember that such distinctions are the result of a post-enlightenment era. Natural and supernatural distinctions did not exist in the ancient Near East. All realms we divide into distinct categories would have been considered one giant realm of God's full domain. Ancient Hebraic authors even wrote that humans were just another beast. Thus, all creatures could have been viewed as beasts created by God. John Walton writes that Nahash would have been viewed as a type of chaos creature and qualify as another creature. Furthermore, we can find interesting parallels in Egyptian inscriptions. In the Old Kingdom of Egypt, predating the birth of Abraham, we find pyramid texts designed to aid the pharaoh on his journey through the afterlife, many of which warn of serpents from the underworld that will attempt to thwart the pharaoh's journey. John Walton says, These utterances contain phrases that are reminiscent of the curse on the serpent in Genesis 3. For instance, the biblical statement that the serpent will crawl on your belly is paralleled by frequent spells that call on the snake to lie down, fall down, get down, or crawl away. Other later texts refer to serpents as gods, like one papyrus, which describes a serpent as the great god who is in the desert mountains. Another interesting text depicts a winged serpent with human legs and reads, Lord of fear in the netherworld, many faced one in the place of silence. Thus, eerie similarities in iconography and language suggest the text of Genesis 3 is closer to an older Egyptian heritage than much later biblical texts written during the Babylonian exile. We also get fresh insight on the curses God places on the Nahash, which are to crawl on his belly eat dust, and his head will be crushed after he strikes a heel. Similarities exist in the Egyptian pyramid texts referring to these otherworldly serpents. The command that the serpent will crawl on his belly is paralleled by frequent Egyptian spells that command the evil serpents to lie down, fall down, get down, or crawl away. These parallels suggest that when the serpent is commanded to crawl on his belly, it doesn't refer to losing limbs. Instead, it is referring to being sent away in a docile position, instead of upright in an attack position. In other words, this suggests that when in Genesis 3, the serpent is crawling on his belly, it refers to the idea of being cast down in a humbling position before God. Next, being told to eat dust does not refer to diet. It suggests the same theme of being cast down. It is similar to our idiom of when we say someone bit the dust. The idiom refers to someone dying, not literally eating dust. Likewise, pyramid texts refer to commands of banishing serpents to the dust. Similarly, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the underworld is referred to as the house of dust. Job 17.16 also refers to Sheol as a place of dust, and Isaiah 26.19 likewise says that those in Sheol or dwellers of dust. Thus the rebellious seraphim will now be cast out of the divine counsel of God into the lowest and most humiliating parts of the cosmos. Ben Stanhope says, It seems likely that double meaning is operative through Genesis 3. The Nahash is a serpentine divine being possessing speech and divine knowledge. Yet the author rhetorically parallels his noble serpentine nature with an actual snake to drive home the abasement through metaphor. Heiser also draws attention to two other biblical passages, 
that shed more light on the curses placed on the Nahash, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Specifically, these passages are describing the rebellion and judgment of earthly kings, but they are described in a way to compare them to the first rebellion in Eden, similar to how recent presidents are often compared to past presidents or past rulers. Both of these passages, along with Isaiah 6 and Genesis 3, take place in a divine council setting. And as we went over in the video on Genesis 2, Eden is set up as a temple and the theological center of the cosmos. Ezekiel 28 parallels this by noting the being is in Eden. Isaiah 14 mentions that the divine being wants to sit on the Mount of Assembly, the Mount of Zaphon, a biblical term meant to represent where God's headquarters were. In each passage, the being or beings are capable of speech. Then these three specific passages describe the characteristics of the rebel very similarly. In Genesis 3, the being is crafty, serpentine, and shining. And as mentioned earlier, serpents were considered symbols of wisdom in the ancient Near East. In Ezekiel 28, the rebel is said to be wise and is called a cherub, a divine throne guardian, which Ezekiel says in chapter 1, gleam like polished bronze, Nehoshet. Then this rebel is said to be covered in gems, which would give the connotation of gleaming or shining. Cherub was a run-of-the-mill term for throne guardian, whereas seraph specifically refers to ontology of a creature. So to the ancient mind, seraphim was probably considered a type of cherub. Finally, Heiser also draws on the work of H.J. Van Dyke in verse 12, where it reads, You were the sealer of perfection. This word for sealer has been difficult to translate for scholars, but Van Dyke speculates that based on word morphology and grammar, that we might have a rare case of an enclitic mem, something which is found in other places in the book of Ezekiel. Van Dyke suggests the final consonant is meant to be silent, thus the phrase would be translated as, you were the serpent of perfection. This is possible, but hard to prove. Finally, Isaiah 14 refers to this rebel as a star, which do shine and were associated with divine beings in the ancient world. This is similar to the seraphim in Isaiah 6, which are described as burning. Next, each of these three passages do parallel in how the divine being is defeated by God. In Isaiah 14, the rebel was brought down to the ground, and down the sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. And as we've established, Sheol is referred to as a place associated with dust. Ezekiel 28 also says the rebel is cast to the ground, and later says the rebel was turned to ashes on the earth, which is similar to the morphology of dust. Both of these passages also refer to the rebel as being humiliated, which is similar to how the serpent in Genesis 3 is cast down on his belly. So Heiser argues, based on all this evidence, there are enough clues to connect the three passages together, as talking about what happened in Eden. Lucifer was originally a divine council member, among other divine serpentine beings. This explains why Eve was perfectly fine having a casual conversation with him. She would have been aware of these divine beings before God in his divine council, similar to what Isaiah witnessed in his vision. However, Eve would have been unaware of any malicious intent until it was too late, and thus the fall of Lucifer and humanity resulted at the same time. He could still bite, but his fate was sealed. One day a child of Eve would crush his skull and seal victory over the serpent.